Thank you, Dean Kreider and musicians, for that beautiful music. Thank you, Mr. President, for the very generous and kind introduction and the invitation uh, to stand here uh, today and to share uh, God's word here in this place. Uh, it, is a, it is a wonderful uh, privilege that I do not take uh, for granted this day. As you all know, I'm merely a short-term pinch hitter in the provost role, happily counting down the days until my service at the interim provost will come to a conclusion. But I do want to take this one opportunity to ask you to think with me about our shared work here at Southwestern Seminary, our work of teaching and learning in this secular age. This morning, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to the Old Testament. I want to put to rest any uh, rumors that I am a Marcionite, that I do know where the Old Testament is. Uh, but I am not an Old Testamentler, I confess, and I know that. And so any uh, concerns or questions that are raised, Dr. Josh Williams has volunteered after chapel to answer uh, all the matters that may come to your mind. But let us look this morning at the book of Ecclesiastes. I want to read three verses from the first chapter and then three verses from the final chapter chapter. Will you please hear the word of the Lord? The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Absolute futility, says the teacher. Absolute futility. Everything is futile. What does a man gain for all his efforts if he labors at under the sun? So remember your creator in the days of your youth. When all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is fear God and keep his commands because this is for all eternity. For God will bring every act to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Some have said that Ecclesiastes is best understood as the delight of skeptics and the despair of saints. The author of Ecclesiastes has been accused of skepticism, agnosticism, fatalism, and pessimism. Not exactly the cheery themes to which one frequently turns to launch a new academic semester. One commentator denounced Ecclesiastes as the strangest book in the entire Bible. Still others have claimed that whoever studies this book is doomed to failure, for it's merely a chasing after the wind. Even the highly respected Old Testament scholar Bruce Walkey in his Old Testament theology described Ecclesiastes as the black sheep of the Old Testament canon. Yet Martin Luther, the great 16th century Reformation leader, claimed that the book of Ecclesiastes should be read daily because it so firmly rejects sentimental religion and religious sentimentality. Not long before his recent death, J.I. Packer was asked, what's your favorite book in the Bible? His answer, Ecclesiastes. So particularly for us this morning, in this academic, this educational setting, this book serves as an invaluable resource for the teaching learning process, as a genuine encouragement for the pursuit of wisdom, and as a valuable guide for our shared worship across the Southwestern campus. So this morning, I want us to think together about worldview, wisdom, and worship teaching and learning in a secular age at Southwestern Seminary. The Wheaton College literary scholar Leland Riken has astutely observed that Ecclesiastes is the most contemporary book in the entire Bible, tackling many of the challenges of secularism by exposing the mad quest to find satisfaction in knowledge, wealth, pleasure, fame, or sex. 3,000 years prior to the publication of the must-read volumes on secularization and related themes by Charles Taylor and others, Ecclesiastes served as a forerunner for us and for those before us on how to interpret and analyze syncretism and secularization. So let us ask the Lord this morning for fresh eyes and open hearts as we look at this 
oft-neglected Old Testament book. My first recollection of being exposed to the book of Ecclesiastes came through the popular music. In the 1960s, the Birds had a number one hit called Turn, 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 which quotes the third chapter of Ecclesiastes. I won't sing it for you this morning, but here it is. There is a season, turn, 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 and a time to every purpose under heaven. I'm sure you can imagine in your mind's eye as you look at this album cover that Ted Cable is up there in his rocker days looking just exactly like that. But the passage of this, uh, on which this hit song was based, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, is still one of the most frequently quoted passages of the Bible, though very few people know its origin or its original context. So together this morning, we want to think about worldview, wisdom, and worship. We'll seek to develop four points around the theme of the teacher who's introduced to us in the very first verse of the book. So let's look at this master class with the teacher. The word translated the teacher in Ecclesiastes 1.1 could easily be translated the gatherer, the philosopher, the professor. Some translations say the preacher, but I think more accurately it is the teacher which captures the identity of our author. This person is not just any teacher. He is a masterful teacher. He is my choice for faculty member of the year. Not only because of what he taught, but for the manner in which he taught it. Some think of the teacher as an enigmatic pessimist. Yet Peter Kreeth, the highly regarded old uh, Boston College philosopher, has rightly made the case that the teacher is a godly sage, going so far as to say the work we know as Ecclesiastes is the greatest of all books of philosophy. By exploring life's tough questions, the teacher presents a powerful polemic against a secular way of viewing life. He accomplishes this purpose by helping us understand life as an under-the-sun perspective. This phrase, under the sun, which we encounter in chapter 1, verse 3, is found in this book about 30 times, and it's not found anywhere else in the entire Old Testament. The phrase is key for understanding this book and represents life lived outside of what former Boston University sociologist Peter Berger called that sacred canopy. The teacher is describing everything from a this-earth-only perspective. Recent Gallup polls and Pew polls suggest that such a perspective, sadly, is quite widespread in our world today. The most recent Gallup polls suggest that only 48% of Americans think religion is important in their lives, which compares to 61% just two decades ago. Similarly, the most recent Pew poll indicates that an ever-expanding 38% of Americans ages 18 to 29 rarely think about God, a radical difference from the 15% of those 50 and older who answered the question the same way. The trends toward expanding this earth-only secularization are undeniable as seen in the attention-grabbing headlines in last week's Washington Post story with the title, American Secularism is Growing and Growing More Complicated. Aaron Wren, in the current issue of First Things magazine, suggests that we're now in the third phase of secularization. He notes that during the first phase, it was still a positive thing to be a Christian. During the second phase, it was neither positive nor negative to be a Christian. It was merely one option that was generally ambivalent. People felt ambivalent about within our pluralized society. 
But Wren claims that not long ago, less than a decade ago, a major shift happened as we moved into the third phase of secularization in North America, one in which it is perceived to be quite negative to be a follower of Christ. The Christian faith and morals being seen as a threat to the public good and new moral public order is seen only from an under-the-sun perspective. In chapter 1, verse 2, all the way to chapter 12, verse 8, there is a second phrase that is vital to us understanding this book and important for our thinking this morning. It describes life lived entirely on this horizontal perspective rather than a vertical one. It is a phrase used about 40 times in this book, and it is translated futility of futility. Vanity of vanities, meaningless, meaningless. This distinctive phrase points to a perspective that can be described as enigmatic, mysterious, vaporous, ephemeral, vain, futile, fleeing, meaningless, transitory. Why then does our teacher describe everything as futile? His answer is understood only through the lens of this this world-only perspective. Everything is fleeting. Everything is fading away when viewed from this standpoint. As one commentator noted, everything is going poof. The doubling of futility points to the teacher's complete and ultimate assessment of life. Futility of futilities. Everything is absolutely futile. Look at verse 2. It claims that everything in life is empty, a vapor, possessing a sense of nothingness. This is futility at its ultimate. What then can be described as futile? The teacher's answer, everything. Everything, claims the teacher. The opening section of the book of Ecclesiastes may well be called the confessions of the teacher. Something very similar to the confessions of St. Augustine several centuries later. In taking this approach, the teacher has chosen to show the utter and absolute futility of a godless understanding of the world. The reason that Ecclesiastes is so often called a track for our times is because our modern world is also trapped in what philosophers and social scientists have described as a secular age. A world lacking a divine meta-narrative. Failing to grasp God's redemptive work and purposes in this world, modern men and women have become easily disgusted and wearied with the repetitiveness and boredom in this world. Agreeing with the teacher, many conclude that everything seems pointless, transitory, vaporous. It's a time for tearing down. It's important for us as we explore the book of Ecclesiastes to recognize the situation being described, the nothingness, the futility, the emptiness is no longer the teacher's perspective, the time of his writing. For he, like Augustine, had experimented widely, but the teacher is now describing those during his lifetime and those during our day as we see in these uh, Uh, polls that we have noted who live life completely under the sun. The seeming despair to which this viewpoint leads, remarks Derek Kidner, need not be ours. We can rejoice in God's faithfulness, which is the fountain of our hope and the basis for our awe and worship. But let's look more closely at the teacher's message to see what he has to say. The teacher's message is very clear. We must choose between two ways of life. We can spend our lives in pursuit of position, prominence, knowledge, or wealth, or we can listen to the teacher. We must confess that the teacher surprises us at times. As a matter of fact, he downright startles us. But here's what I want us to be sure to see regarding the teacher's approach to teaching and learning. He does not retreat from fully exploring the challenges of this under-the-sun mindset. The teacher does not call us into isolation. He does not call us into separation. Instead, he calls us to engagement. He chooses to engage the challenges, to analyze the issues, and then to evaluate them. 
the depth and comprehensiveness of the teacher's abilities to engage and interact with the world around him demonstrate not only his brilliance, they make us, they call for us to engage also with authentic inquiry, to to always be thinking about how we engage this secular culture in which we are called to serve. In doing so, we recognize the great breadth of the teacher's interaction with matters of philosophy and literature, with culture and finance, with education and social structures, with political and judicial matters, with leadership and relationship, with matters of time and eternity, and ultimately with questions of life and death to which he gives so much attention in this book. The teacher was hardly captive to the compartmentalization of our day. Long before Sir Thomas More, the brilliant Desiderius Erasmus, our teacher was the pioneer Renaissance thinker. While the teacher preceded several centuries, what we often call the great Christian intellectual tradition, it would not be wrong to recognize the teacher as the father of such a great line of wise thinkers. Following his engaging explorations, he thoughtfully and insightfully concludes that this godless philosophy will not satisfy one's mind. Pleasure alone will not bring joy. Materialism will not fill our lives. It may fill our pockets, but it leaves our souls empty. Moralism, he claimed, will not satisfy our conscience. Neither will religious sentimentality, thoughtless shallow piety, nor zealous activism. It all leaves us still yearning for something more. And the teacher reminds us how easily we become deluded, diverted, deceived by sentimentality on the one side and secularization on the other. Many have misunderstood the teacher's message, thinking these perplexing proverbs to be a string of merely random thoughts. However, quite the opposite is true. There is powerful purpose to his discussion of purposelessness. There is immense depth of meaning to his exposition of meaninglessness. So let's take a step closer to what the teacher calls the conclusion of the matter over in chapter 12. The words of this final chapter represent the words of a mature sage, one who has spent many days on this earth, yet we do not find here some tired and over-rehearsed prohibitions of some grumpy old man. Instead, we hear words to cheer the heart, to invigorate the spirit. These students are encouraged to rejoice in this life, but ultimately they're called upon to remember their creator. Here in chapter 12, verse 1, we have the key turn in this book. Ecclesiastes calls young and old alike to serious connections between theology and learning, seeking to connect all of life with our creator God. We're to raise our vision beyond the things that can be seen under the sun, looking to those trajectories that move us toward the discovery and celebration of true meaning in this life. My friend, Walt Kaiser, the former president at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, contends that Ecclesiastes brings together a coherent worldview, appealing to the unity of truth made possible by the one God who is the creator of the universe. Such a comprehensive perspective and understanding of life is impossible apart from a recognition of God as the one true creator of all that is. And what could be more important for our consideration at a time when the most recent Barna poll claims that sadly only 6% of North Americans have genuine Christian worldview commitments. The masterful teacher then points us toward a Christian worldview, toward truth that our lives are to be shaped and characterized by reflections on our Creator God. This kind of remembrance is far more than some trivial reminder. It involves letting our whole perspective of life be shaped and formed by our shared confession. We believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. This confession is a call to remember 
much like we find in other portions of wisdom literature that we have heard this morning calling us to fear the Lord. The teacher has thus framed this massive argument with a full orb and intentional focus on the ultimate questions bearing on the topics of God, culture, humankind, and the very meaning of life and death. While certainly we want to give careful, ample attention during your days here on this campus while you were a student to the important development of ministry skills, we must not fail to learn to think deeply about God and his redemptive work, to be formed and transformed as individuals and as an academic community by God's revelation of these truths. The call to remember in chapter 12, verse 1, then includes much more than mental reflection, so much more than basic recall. The invitation serves as an open door for us to immerse our lives in the very ways of God, in all that he has done, in all that he's doing, and all that he will do. It provides for us an invitation to think theologically about God, his creative work, his providential ways, his redemptive work in the world and in our lives. Moreover, in light of these things, it's a call to be prepared to hear and act upon the final charge in this book, which is to worship God and to live with wisdom. So let's now look at his third point, the teacher's manner of teaching. Up to this point, we tried to observe the teacher's content. Now we want to turn our our attention to the teacher's approach or his manner of teaching, how he taught these things, how he reached these conclusions, what his teaching means for us here today. First, in chapter 12, verse 9, we observe that the teacher was a diligent researcher, one who sought to find and to communicate truth. Let us not fail to see that a call to faithful teaching is simultaneously a call to serious research. As a reminder, our new academic plan, which was formed and informed by the Southwestern faculty during this past year, calls for those of us in this place to extend the institution's influence in the larger evangelical world, not only through teaching excellence, but through thoughtful faculty research, and scholarship. The teacher was not content to merely rest upon his abilities or his credentials. We're told in chapter 12, verses 9 through 11, that the teacher spent much time in preparation in order to sort through all the sayings and then to communicate them in an orderly way. According to the teacher, teaching and research, or we might say ministry and preparation, must go hand in hand together. Not only was he a diligent researcher, but he also was a gifted communicator who found the best pedagogical approaches to be able to present these delightful sayings. The teacher's approach has been summarized by one commentator with three descriptive phrases. It says he taught with consistent clarity, with literary artistry, and with intellectual integrity. Moreover, we see his diligent preparation and presentation involved accurately writing words of truth. Chapter 12, verse 10. By the use of carefully chosen phrases, the teacher has with great wisdom presented a powerful and cohesive argument for the meaning of life, doing so by showing the meaninglessness of life apart from God. Research, careful pedagogical skills, clear argumentation, thoughtful word selection were all important traits of this masterful teacher. But if he failed to push his students toward truth, he would have failed miserably. Regardless of the innovation, creativity, or eloquence, his teaching would have been found lacking. So what was true for the teacher in this regard must remain at the forefront of our responsibilities on this campus today. Our wise teacher has emphasized the communication of truth. He has painted a portrait of what life is like apart from God, what life is like disconnected from the sacred canopy by describing the futility of everything under the sun. In this sense, the teacher has certainly 
challenged our minds. He's brought clarity to our thinking. He's touched our hearts all the while pointing us, guiding us toward God and the things of God's kingdom. It would not have been enough to communicate it in such an eloquent fashion had the teacher not also fully uncovered the futility of life that has been described as life under the sun. So let us recognize that Ecclesiastes is not so much a treatment of systematic theology as is a work of apologetics, providing the kind of pre-evangelistic work so necessary, so needed in our syncretistic and secularized context. Indeed, to borrow the words from Charles Taylor and Jamie Smith, our teacher has taught us how not to be secular. Likewise, those of us on the Southwestern campus must set our hearts and our minds on honoring God in our daily pursuits. Following the teacher, we must come to the place of recognizing that all knowledge, all truth, all wisdom find their source in God, our only wise shepherd, according to chapter 12, verse 11. When we do so, our teaching and our learning will be transformed. We see the bringing together of information and formation, of learning and faithful theological commitments, of godly commitment and intellectual seriousness, of worship and wisdom skillfully and splendidly exemplified for us in this high and worthy calling that is ours to pursue together in a wholehearted and flourishing manner. Which brings us to the final point, the conclusion of the matter. In some, here's the teacher's conclusion. In learning and in life, we're called to worship God and live with wisdom. But let's flesh that out just a bit. We must recognize that these are the primary purposes of life for the very beginning, middle, and end of life as we know it on this earth. Thus, the final message from the teacher is not that nothing matters, but that everything matters. Because everything matters to God, not just the study of the Bible, not just the study of theology, but art, music, economics, education, history, hermeneutics, the humanities, intercultural studies, missiology, counseling, family ministry, everything that we do across this campus, it all matters. He would not want us to shy away from engaging the great ideas of history and the pressing issues of our day. Yet in the midst of our perplexing questions, particularly in this moment of this ongoing pandemic, we come before God and we bow down to worship Him, to revere Him, to adore Him, to live life faithfully in community before Him, living life quorum deo in the presence of God. Life's meaning is wrapped up, says our teacher, in the worship of God and in a life wisely lived before Him. For the greatest thing in this life and in the next is to come before the majestic triune God, our Creator and Redeemer, in worship and adoration of who He is and what He has done for us. We must recognize that nowhere in the Bible are we merely called to worship but to direct our worship to the Creator God. Like the teacher in his confessions in the book of Ecclesiastes, we're prone to worship just about anything that comes along, to chase other tantalizing options surrounding us. We cheer our teams. We fawn over beauty. We pursue wealth. We become enamored with the latest trend. We celebrate the hero of the moment. The truth, however, is this, that anything else we worship will turn life upside down and inside out. Thus, the conclusion of the matter is that we are to fear and worship the one true and living God. If we do not rightly order our lives and our adoration, our lives remain confused. As Augustine said 1,500 years ago, he observed that God made us for himself and that our hearts are restless till they rest in him. The teacher has offered us light and life in contrast to darkness and death. 
He's taught us to abandon our haughty and arrogant illusions of self-importance and to accept our ultimate dependence upon the Creator God who is in heaven. The discovery that human omnipotence is in fact an illusion is the necessary precondition to the rediscovery of the power of God in the place of authentic worship in our lives. The teacher earlier had declared that under the sun there's nothing new. There's a seeming sameness, an ongoing sameness to all things. Yet the teacher's questions and observations provide us a pathway to wisdom a gateway to see the rest of the biblical story with greater clarity. It is as though the book of Ecclesiastes serves as a hermeneutical window into the rest of the Bible so that we can understand the biblical message aright. The major themes then presented to us in Holy Scripture that make up this organizing meta-narrative, this overarching picture of what God is doing, creation, incarnation, redemption, resurrection, judgment, all of these are new acts of God that have come to us without, made known to us by one who has stepped out of eternity into time. We understand God's providential plan then, not in the sameness of the each and every day, but with understanding what God is doing in bringing all things to a providential destiny as he brings his redemptive plan into place. Because God has placed eternity in our hearts, chapter 3, verse 11, we long for something beyond what can be seen under the sun. We long for something beyond the sameness of each and every day. The good news is that in Jesus Christ, that longing has been fulfilled. The new has come. Eternity has stepped into time. In the work of God, transcendent hope and full-orbed macro meaning has been provided for us in this life. And life to come has been promised. We are now able by God's Spirit to clearly and truly see the conclusion of the matter. Life's meaning and purpose are grounded in the Creator God and the revelation of Himself and His redemptive purposes for us in Jesus the Christ. So for this reason, Southwestern educators and Southwestern students, at this time in the midst of this ever-expanding secular age, are more and more to be characterized by teaching excellence, learning excellence, by intellectual seriousness, by evangelical faithfulness, by academic rigor, reflective engagement, as well as authentic worship and wise Christian commitments for the living of these days. These things must be more than lip service for us on this campus. As we begin the 2022 year, let us give thanks for the teacher and his inspired teaching. Even as we dedicate ourselves afresh to the authentic worship of the triune God, to the pursuit of true wisdom, to a fuller understanding of a comprehensive biblical worldview, to God honoring excellence in all that we do and following the example of the teacher recommitting ourselves at the start of this semester to the high calling that is ours of teaching and learning as well as worldview, wisdom, and worship for the glory of God on the Southwestern campus. Will you join me please as we pray together? We are grateful, O oh God, even as we have sung earlier this morning, that your holy word provides for us a firm foundation, a sure and certain guide. We thank you for the inspired words from the teacher, ancient words, ever true for us, even on this day. Grant to us conviction and illumination in the midst of the challenges presented by our secular context. We desire to be people who worship you and praise you for your inestimable love 
and for making yourself known to us both in creation and in the redemptive work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that in your mercy you would grant us wisdom for the living of these days and for our shared service on this campus. Particularly on this day, we pray for those who teach and those who learn, rejoicing in the knowledge of the truth that we may serve you from generation to generation through Jesus Christ, our Lord.